I want to welcome all of you to this uh, new opening session of the World of Congress 2023 that will be celebrated in New York in July next year. We are advancing in our program regarding climate change and uh, new energies. Today, we are celebrating a new debate about the energy market, new or old challenges. For sure, energy is one of the most important objects of discussion in the whole world. We have been used for decades that energy was there, that the market was working in a proper way and accessible power was always at uh, our disposal. Today, particularly in Europe, we face the risk that every country goes their own way to establish their own energy policy, their own energy model. That would be probably a hard challenge, actually an attack to the fundaments of the European Union that has been constructing not just a political community, but also a common market based on common models and common rules. So the energy market has been disrupted through the war in Ukraine. And today, we really don't know how to fix it. There are many different options. It's a Iberian exception. It's a German way. It's, uh, you, you know, it's all the different things. But at the end of the day, gas is probably in the center. How do we find a solution to cap, to control the price of gas? There is really a very confusing situation where not just particular domestic cost customers, but also industries are suffering of legal insecurity, uh, a very high demand and increase of prices, and actually a really uncertain situation regarding whether the energy has, is going to be there the next winter. In order to discuss how to progress in controlling climate change, in combating climate change, and at the same time to provide to everybody energy needed to cool their houses and fridges in summer, or to warm it in winter and to make transport available and to make life as it has been in the last uh, decades. Uh, we need to really understand all the legal aspects of the market uh, regarding energy. For that reason, we have collect, we have put together a very powerful panel where we are going to find incredible specialists like Kenerva Sunila from Finland, our Luis Eduardo San Miguel from Colombia, Jose Ramon Bauza, Spanish member of European Parliament, Manuel Pulgar Vidal uh, from Peru, uh, who is going to be uh, moderating this panel. So let's start the discussion. Let's uh, hear the actual leaders of knowledge, uh, real experts in this situation, where really it's very difficult to have a clear view of what needs to be done from a legal point of view. So uh, finally, Diego Solá is going to uh, read the conclusions and, and put the final to this uh, new opening session. I want to thank you, all of you uh, attending right now via YouTube, uh, of, through our webpage, but also in the future, having a look at this uh, contribution. And I also want to thank all of you that are working on this campaign Peace uh, Through Law. So the World Jurist Association was founded uh, almost 60 years ago with the sole purpose of promoting the rule of law versus the rule of man. Either we are living in a 
world ruled by laws or a party, an individual, someone with, its non, with enough strength or force will rule of our lives. So that's, it's not just a general topic or a constitutional issue. It also comes to particular liberties like access to energy. That's the focus of today. Let's have a good discussion and thank you for attending and thank you particularly to the panelists for uh, providing us with their expertise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Javier. Uh, it's going to be a pleasure for me to be the moderator of uh, this session. My name is uh, Juan Diego Diaz. I'm uh, the chairman of the Spanish Wind Association. Obviously, this uh, topic about uh, energy is uh, very, very wide. Uh, I would like to frame this topic a little bit uh, through the, the energies that are going to be the future, especially the so-called uh, alternative energies that uh, are not alternative energies anymore, but uh, it's going to be the new energies that are uh, renewable. Okay, so, uh, well, first of all, I would like uh, to state that there are no doubts about renewable energy. Uh, well, it is not the future, it is, it is today. If you have a look into the World Energy Outlook that uh, the, international, uh, uh, the International Agency released uh, in October, more than 75% of the new energy installed in 21 worldwide has been wind and PV. And it meant more than 250 gigawatts all over the world. From that, uh, more than uh, 93 gigawatts were installed in 21 in wind. And it was another record breaking uh, year for solar in 2021 with more than 168 gigawatts installed. And from these, almost 50% of wind and PV was installed in China. So a huge amount. So uh, additionally, if we have a look into the main uh, countries or regions, there are clear EU targets. 34% uh, of final energy consumption is going to come from renewable in 2030. Also, the International Energy Agency uh, published a report in October. The forecast of the International Energy Agency that it's not uh, an, or, uh, an, an organization that is <laughs> very, very prone into, into renewables is forecasting renewables to meet 80% of electricity demand by 2030. And it also calls for the end uh, of new oil and gas exploration. In this moment, uh, gas is in the very center, uh, Javier mentioned in the introduction, but uh, definitely it shouldn't be the future. Only natural gas is going to outrun the renewables uh, revolution but uh, it will need some capacity market uh, mechanisms. In the meantime, there's going to be a huge retirement of thermal assets, but it's going to drive a deeper introduction of renewables. Definitely, this is not going to happen in uh, 2022 or 2023, especially in Europe, considering the situation that uh, we have right now. But uh, once everything goes smoother, definitely it's going to happen. Additionally, uh, the electricity and uh, the hydrogen are going to be the drivers for renewable energy penetration, not only at the electricity level, but also uh, in uh, some, some, other, uh, some other applications. And uh, very specifically, they're going to be the drivers for uh, CO2 reduction. In the meantime, if we have a look into what happened uh, with, uh, with PB, that as mentioned, uh, has been the largest, uh, it had this, the largest installation all over the world. Uh, I mentioned almost 170 gigawatts in just one year, what is simply amazing. So what happened in the past was uh, that uh, in 2020, the, insolve the insolvency by the two biggest US solar manufacturers uh, left the world without non-Chinese PV manufacturers. So it means that uh, these uh, 170 gigawatts, almost 100% of all was installed depending on Chinese manufacturers. 
So at the end of the day, at a certain extent, we are exchanging in Europe uh, the gas from Putin from the PV from China. The European Union, uh, especially this year, finally realized about the need of European PV and microchips manufacturers, and that definitely is pushing for some programs to incentivize local manufacturing. But I wonder, and this is going to be something to be discussed later on, perhaps it's too late, because uh, it's in this moment when uh, Chinese manufacturers have this power, it's going to be simply impossible uh, to enter uh, again in this market, take into account that 20 years ago, Europe was the leader in PV, and right now, Europe has nothing, US has nothing, and only Chinese manufacturers. If we have a look into uh, what, what is the situation of the market, and we, we focus specifically in wind, the conclusion is clear. Only 23% of the market is accessible without any free trade barriers for Western manufacturers. Why is this? Well, it is clear. 50% uh, of the market is China. And uh, the situation in China, well, uh, we all know what is uh, China. Uh, this lack of transparency that uh, uh, up to a certain extent uh, we have, a transparency, I mean, in the sense of uh, companies that uh, are uh, state-owned and a part of the incomes are coming from indirect uh, sources. So 50% of the market is China. 23% of the market are tier one markets, but with barriers, we will see a little bit. And then just 23% of the market are coming from tier one markets uh, without barriers. And if, if we have a look into them, these markets are mainly European markets. Let's have a look into these uh, barriers that I mentioned. If we go to uh, countries that theoretically are uh, uh, free trade, like uh, Canada, well, for instance, in Quebec regions, there's a requirement of 50% Quebec source content for the Hydro-Quebec options, and it's including complete project wind turbine plus BOP. Even in the United States, there are several tariffs, for instance, the section 232, the famous steel tariff, 25% tariff on steel imports, or 25 tariff on imported Chinese goods. But what is going to be the main barrier is the so-called build back better. Uh, is not currently in effect it's going to be implemented quite soon through a mechanism that it's called IRA and would provide a bonus to the production tax credit uh, if US components are used. It's very similar to what is happening also in Brazil, that it's also a lead market with a local content requirement. Uh, this local content is absolutely requir required to uh, get the BNDES financing. Without this local content, you don't get this financing. And taking into account the financial cost in Brazil, it's simply impossible to finance uh, reasonably a project without this BNDES financing, making that almost 100% of the projects uh, meet this local content requirement. Uh, in South Africa, it's a little bit different. There's a broad-based Black Economic Empowerment Act. Theoretically, it was done to advance economic transformation and to enhance the economic participation of Black people in uh, the South African economy. And under this uh, scheme, under the option, 70% of the evaluation is the tariff uh, uh, bidded, while 30% of the evaluation is an economic development. Uh, quite similar in uh, South Korea, where it's required a local content also. Uh, PPA price, the price you sell the energy is impacted by local content. So if you have higher local content, you get uh, more price. And uh, even India, there's a local content requirement also. If uh, a wind turbine manufacturer wants to be listed in uh, the revised list of models and manufacturers, there's one requirement and is to have an cell manufacturing plant in the country. Additionally, uh, in Europe, if we have a look into what has happened uh, for energy prices uh, 
all over Europe. We have uh, case studies in Spain, in Italy, in Germany, but uh, the conclusion of all of them are exactly the same. Uh, for instance, in Germany, uh, auction prices that are quite high compared to the rest of Europe are in the range of 60, 65 euros per megawatt hour. Uh, so it's pushing quite a lot all the supply chain, considering that the, the forward price for Germany for, fisc for, for calendar year uh, 23, instead of these 60, 65 euros per megawatt hour, today is 1,050 euros per megawatt hour. So it's a huge gap. More or less the same, for instance, in Spain, prices uh, for auctions have been between 25 and 30 euros, and uh, prices forecasted for uh, 2023 are in the range of 250, so 10 times more. So we, I would say, in, uh, in, in Europe and politicians in Europe have been absolutely obsessed with price, uh, losing this uh, sign up that it's uh, absolutely mandatory of the industry. The industry in Europe and to protect the industry in Europe is absolutely critical. So right now, Western manufacturers are in a very, very complex situation, taking into account, first of all, these extremely low prices uh, in auctions, some very low prices in PPAs that were closed uh, years ago, and additionally, that many of these contracts are negotiated two, three, five years in advance uh, with uh, commodity prices totally different than the ones that we have uh, right now. And the situation right now is uh, absolutely critical considering that uh, the four relevant uh, global uh, manufacturers that are Vestas, GE, Nordex, and Siemens Gamesa, the four of them are in losses. So uh, for the, the forecast for fiscal year 22, is having negative results. In the meantime, obviously, Chinese manufacturers are trying to enter, to enter the market. Uh, these manufacturers are knocking on Western doors, clearly trying to enter. And uh, well, the situation is, as I mentioned, there are very le relevant free trade uh, barriers in most of the countries with just a small part, if it's only Europe, that it's uh, absolutely free. So that's uh, all from my side. I, I, I would like uh, to open the floor to the rest of the panelists. Uh, we are going to start uh, with uh, Kanerva Sunile. She comes from Finland, a senior associate for environment, infrastructure, natural resources, and energy at Kastren and uh, Snellon. Please, uh, Kanerva. Yes, thank you, Juan, for great great presentation uh, and also for Javier to put this this discussion um, to the context. Uh, in my speech I, I'll take a few steps back maybe and I'll try to uh, provide somewhat maybe a bit more theoretical uh, point of view as well uh, relating to the current developments in the EU which were also mentioned here, and of course, are the kind of like context for the discussion about free trade as well. Uh, as Javier said, so the, this title, uh, Energy Market New or Old Challenges, this is very broad. This could be addressed from many, many point of views, and uh, free trade is definitely one of them. Uh, as an energy lawyer or energy market lawyer from Finland, uh, of course, this brings me first to the to think about the current situation in the EU and energy markets. And uh, well, of course, as, as was mentioned, so in many European countries currently, people are actually worried about how they can afford to uh, heat their homes or cool their homes during during the summer. In Finland, we have seen retailers going uh, in bankruptcy. Uh, we have seen the problems uh, with electricity producers who are struggling with increasing guarantee requirements and so forth. So, as was said, so the EU countries and uh, our EU, EU member states, national energy markets, as well as the EU energy market, <laughs> is currently in somewhat chaotic situation. 
The EU countries, legislators, the European Commission are currently trying to mitigate this chaos uh, by temporary measures. As we know, they are trying to um, make temporary amendments to market rules and by proposing, for example, uh, demand reductions. And we can also see if the question is whether these are new or old challenges, so we can actually see the information campaigns to reduce energy consumption, which are familiar from the 17s, I would say. Uh, the security of energy supplies, even though we have taken, taken them as, or we have taken it as a granted, so it has been really questioned by this current crisis. The crisis has also questioned affordable energy, which we are used to, and coming to the third angle of the energy trilemma, the sustainability, and in this case, many cases, uh, energy transition. So this is still something which has been considered as a solution to the current crisis. But of course, we can see some concerning remarks as well to the leading to opposite developments currently in the EU energy markets. And as was said, it's clear that these problems currently, they are because of the disruptions in gas supplies mainly, and intrinsically they are because of the Europe dependency on Russian fossil fuels. And we are also facing exceptional weather conditions and droughts in Europe and so forth. So the circumstances currently are quite extraordinary and they bring out unforeseen problems as well. But even though these unforeseen and extraordinary uh, problems, so I would say that many of the challenges and also related to free trade, so these problems are not maybe new, but in these circumstances, so they are magnified. As has been pointed by earlier speakers, as has been pointed by the European Commission in its report EU plan in, uh, in spring, the very important part of answering the crisis is an accelerated clean energy transition. And here I would come back to the really like the fundamentals which we need to uh, remember here. So we should simultaneously, of course, ensure that the transition is just for consumers, households, but we should also provide the investment environment to the energy companies because the investment needs are currently huge. So we need investment certainty. And well, I think none of us, us have really good like solution yet or answer to this, how to take both sides into account. But I guess this is, this is something that European legislators are cur currently struggling with. Uh, in addition to the investment certainty, I would like to point out that we need still flexibility as well. We are facing new technologies or we should uh, deploy new technologies in the markets as well. And here, um, which what I, I have been uh, a bit concerned is that we have uh, more and more complex legislative framework, which is now even temporarily amended. Uh, but in also in normal situations, we are going through towards very, very complex uh, legal framework, which may also lead to situations which are actually like hindering new technologies coming into the market. But maybe a more general point of view. So from a lawyer's point of view, the crisis has kind of like more practical consequences. Because actions are needed quickly and legislation must be implemented quickly. So this leads to question that how we're going to still ensure the quality of legislation here, how 
uh, electricity market legislation, which is, as I said, very complex. So it's how to preserve its fundamentals because it has been built on certain fundamentals. And if those fundamentals are questioned, the preparation and the assessment should be done in a very careful way. Also, what we can see currently uh, from a legal and maybe more, more general point of view, it's a classical question of what is the role of state, actually. And again, coming quite near to the free market or free trade uh, question as well. So what is the role of states both in this crisis and in longer term in energy transition? The states are certainly, of course, they are legislatures. They are sovereign actors in the international law context. They are negotiating uh, free trade uh, investment uh, agreements. But also, what is actually how deep they should go in guiding politically the development of energy systems? I think this question comes all the time, kind of. And what, what is actually, what is the right level there? And how much should be left to the market actors themselves? Uh, in addition to this, I would also point out that, for example, in Finland, we have recently had quite intense public discussion on the state as the owner of energy companies. So what, what kind of solution that may be, or what kind of problems are actually related to the state as an owner of energy companies. The final challenge, which I would like to raise here, there are of course plenty of more, but I, I'm uh, trying to be uh, limited in seven minutes in my speech, but the role of cooperation and the rule of law during this particular crisis as well. In the Nordics, uh, where the power market has provided a model, which was as well referred earlier. So this has provided a model of a successful regional cooperation. And it has also enabled Finland to become quite, well, quite green already, quite clean in a, when considering the production of electricity. Uh, but we see currently proposals for restricting electricity exports. And of course, in the international context, the scale of this kind of, uh, well, scale of question of rule of law is currently a completely uh, different level. And I think that still during the hard times, abandoning the commonly agreed rules is not the solution. If the rules need to be changed, and I'm referring now to energy market rules, so they need to be renegotiated. So to sum up and to answer to the question of the title which we have today, I do not think that the root cause or the challenges we are facing today are new, but the current situation is very new. And um, yeah, and I think this is maybe something which we need to take into account as well when considering the free trade aspects. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kanerba. Uh, a pleasure uh, to have with you today. So right now, it's uh, the floor is for uh, Luis Lara San Miguel. He's from Colombia and based in the US. He's a strategic advisor and founder of uh, Procorp and former VP of Halliburton. Please, Luis Eduardo. Thank you, uh, uh, Diego, and thank you, everybody for attending today and also Javier for his introductory remarks. It's, it's quite complex. Um, that is not new. Uh, let me share with you a screen so we can go to five or six slides. So that will help me to portray my, my thoughts to the whole team. Just let me know when you see the screens, please. Yeah, we can see the screen. Okay, so I want to cover two, four topics about the core challenge that this part of the, uh, of the questions of the audience today. Is this a new challenge or not? 
what is the journey, what are the lessons from the past, and what I what I see the light at the end of the tunnel. This is something that everybody is familiar with, but uh, paraphrasing some of the word that Juan Diego said before, the world is consuming around 170,000 terawatts of energy. 170,000 terawatts of energy. And at the end of 2021, 50,000 is oil, 40 plus thousand is coal, 40,000 is gas. And there is a little growth in you see here in the last couple of years on solar and wind. And I think that Juan already explained all the challenges of the PV manufacturing, which is associated with, with solar. So it is not a new challenge in the sense that uh, in this generation has been forever associated with fossil fuels. We in the industry, uh, in the fossil fuel industry, in the oil and gas business, we knew that. And we also know that it's not renewable. So we always thought about how long it's gonna take, how much time do we have, how much can we reinvent ourselves? And what happened is that technology always, always came to help to the last minute to find new ways of producing more and more from existing wells, from the 60s assets, et cetera, et cetera. But it's what I call a kinetic effect. It's like having a huge train going at high speed you know, the good braking system, you can't stop it. You just can't stop it from one day to another. So we need to go with that. And at the end of the day, even today, of those 170,000 terawatts or 170 pentawatts of production of energy, 33% is still oil, 27 gas, uh, I'm sorry, coal and 24% gas. I would like to suggest that uh, the infrastructure of the oil and gas is still so large, so huge, that it's going to take a while to really make a change. Now, let's talk about the journey. If you agree with me that the challenge is not new, but the conditions are completely new, we have a new journey. And the new journey is being led by this commitment to net zero, carbon neutral, you know, the Earth, you know, is at 1.1 centigrade, warmer than in the 1800s. We can, we can go above 1.5. It would be catastrophic. That's why in the Paris Accord and the net zero, we, several countries agreed to reduce 45% by 2030 and net zero by 2050. That requires not complete eradication of the fuel fossils, but compensation to carbon oxide capture. And this, I suggest put a new challenge. That's the new aspect of the challenge. Now we have a time, now we have a clear goal and we need to accomplish that. Still from the energy sector, three quarters of the energy is, is coming from the, from, the, from the oil and gas. So the core challenge is not new, is my suggestion to the whole team here, but the journey and the timings are different. And net zero needs to be accomplished. But we are facing post-pandemic, we are facing microeconomics, we are facing war, we are facing supply chain constraints, either in LNG supply or even gas via gas pipelines, all of that, and the world is highly, highly polarized today. On top of that, you know, the developing countries need new energy. The countries that are already developed need a stable supply of energy to a raising demand, because if you remember the first graph in 1965, the worldwide consumption was around the 50,000 terawatts, and now we're in the 170,000 terawatts. The world hasn't increased population that much, but the energy consumption that. So my suggestion is that what is new is a completely different sense of urgency. I think that Juan Diego uh, explained about part of that on the manufacturing side of the free trading zone. Uh, I can never also talk about the legal aspect of that. Uh, the, the overall challenge, like say Javier, of countries trying to get with their own solution uh, because we still don't have all the meetings of the mind together. Uh, but let me go now to the lessons of the past. And, and it's about resilience. You know, from the specific oil and gas perspective, uh, I don't think that we can cope with the new demand of migrating very, very fast. 
the, the oil and gas industry has been to many, many cycles. The frequency of the cycles keep increasing, meaning that it happens more and more often. And with every negative cycle, the companies do most or less the same thing. We put the brakes, uh, we let some people go, we lower the capex, et cetera, et cetera. But in the past, when we needed to increase production again, we follow a cycle again. It took a while, but we do it. We do it. But despite that DNA know-how, I suggest there are three major reasons why now it's going to be much more difficult to migrate 100% or more focus to gas rather than to oil to help in these in this, in this new goals and new challenges. One is people. People don't want to work in the oil and gas anymore. They are tired of, of the cycles. Whoever was a willing in the past to come back to the business after being laid off or something like that, that's gone. New generations don't want to work in the oil and gas business. Uh, energy, perhaps, but oil and gas, no. Financial institutions tighten all the capex release, money release for capex, meaning that they are more stringent on the reserves analysis. In the past was once a year, now it's twice a year. Depending on your reserves, you get a percentage of that as a loan. That that's, is, is basically cutting many, many companies to try to get back into the game. And, and finally, all this environmental situation. So one of the examples is that uh, fracking, you know, gas is required, you want to go more massive to, to gradually to have fracking, and then you got the problem. You need more water for fracking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I suggest that there is an end, light at the end of the tunnel. And the reason I say that is because, you know, there are clear goals. You know, I always tell people uh, when we talk in serious conference or in less serious debates, uh, do not bet. Do not bet against the res resilience of the European Union or the United States in their ability to reinvent themselves. Don't, don't bet against that. Because history has shown that there are ways to come back. Europe has gone through, through major world wars. Uh, the United States has gone through major changes as well. Do not bet against the ability of the European Union or the United States to reinvent. But it requires a concentrated effort in a magnitude that we probably haven't seen in the past. There is a path, you know, the, the renewable needs to grow, can grow at this pace. The oil consumption can go lower. Uh, the coal consumption may go lower because as you very well know, the major consumption is China. And that's a big if, but the path is there. The execution is not simple, but the path is there. So I think that as part of the clear goals, we need to have the design and the implementation of new political, economical, and borderless solution, ergo the free trade, that in turn creates economies of scale for the alternatives through what I want to call a very solid ecosystem. And the reason that I want to put that in a simple way, although it's a complex, very complex matter, is because at the end of the day, it's going to come from entrepreneurship. It's going to come from the creativity and from capital markets. And there is another debate about that and what is the role like, like uh, Canerva say about the government. But I don't see that there is a conflict. There got to be a way to align both. But governments don't have the creativity. Governments don't have the, the sense of urgency, the speed of sense of urgency required for the change. We need to create an ecosystem that is going to be led by the governments in an accelerator type of program that made the mark capital markets going to what they know what to do. As an example, you look at the mer mergers and acquisition activity leading consolidation of the energy market in the last years, it was in the range of 30, 40, 30, around $30 billion of consolidation per year. You see a decrease in the last two years because of the pandemics, but even in 2021, uh, we came back with 27 billion plus of transactions. I think 20, 2022 is gonna be the same. And yes, the governments cannot subsidize, but the capital markets, if they see the opportunity, they will do it. And that's one, that's one, one role. And at the end of the day, my, my, my thought process is around the ecosystem that's gonna fuel this transition. 
First, the government as an accelerator. You know, you heard about incubators, the different uh, business model where entrepreneurs come and do their business. The government needs to be the best accelerator that exists for the transition. Then the mar capital market will follow through. Then renewable energies, whether it's or, uh, uh, PV, uh, solar, or is uh, wind, or is hydrogen, but we haven't talked about that, uh, will find a way. The, the, the issue, like I said many times already, is going to be the timing. But with the right environment, with the right capital markets, the entrepreneurs will find a way to accelerate the transition to the renewable energies if they see the carrot at the end of the stick. And of course, there will be a very important role of the IT technology because we need traceability, we need to be accountability, we need to have trading system that allow us to, at the end of the 2030 to 2050, do the trading uh, for the uh, carbon oxygen bonds uh, to be able to compensate one group or another. So the question that I was asked before the meeting was, you know, are the experience of the past gonna help us to this transition? And my answer is not directly, but if we, if we analyze the resilience of the industries and the resilience of the European Union and the United States in the past on different challenges, I have no doubt that the experience of the past is going to help. The challenge now is the timing. And uh, I suggest that the government needs to act as, as accelerators on this. OK. Thank you very much, uh, Luis Eduardo. That's a great uh, presentation. And right now it's time for Jose Ramon Bauza. Uh, he comes from Spain, but uh, very seldom in Spain. He's a member of the EU Parliament Commission on Transport. Uh, the floor is yours, Jose Ramon. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Javier and Juan Diego, Julie. It's for me, it's a very high pleasure to be with you surrounded such uh, interest, interest panelists. So as a coordinator of the Transport and Tourism Committee, as well as member of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament, I would like to give you a broader picture of the market and the influences that attack directly to how define market rules, so important nowadays. So in my opinion, we could speak of three major energy transition in the modern area. First of all, the transition from wood to coal. Second one, the coal to fossil fuels, especially oils. And the third one, the carbon transition to renewable energies. So all the three have faced similar social and economical challenges. The first one, the coal transition driven by the industrial revolution was confronted, to, uh, confronted by Ludens as well as Carison. Second, the oil transition was marked by the fatal consequences of the world war that we obviously we all know. And third, and the third transition to renewables has a major social challenge, which is the mobilization of public opinion and mass information. So the first issue I think we need to define is who will be the main pillar of this transition. So the one who must be at the center of the policies that we, the policymakers, must adopt. And in this case, I am talking about those who have to deliver the transition. Um, this pillar is industry. In this case, it's interest investing, and that will continue to invest, will carry out the transition. We, policymakers, we must provide them with the framework for implementation, but always with the ultimate goal in mind, a lifelong world for our citizens. History has shown us that the energy transitions have always been carried out thanks to the technological evolution. In this case of coal, it was the industrial revolution. It was also the case with oil. Finally, or firstly, the fatal arm race towards the two towards wars. And secondly, the race between the two major powers at the moment, the USA and the URSS. And it is being the case with the technological transition, which is taking place at the most transformative moment in our socials and in society since the end of the World War II. Socially, 
the pandemic caused by COVID-19 has led to the largest demographic dislocation since 1945. Economically, we are experiencing increases in public debt only comparable to the reconstruction plan of post was in Europe. And industrially speaking, we are living the fourth industrial revolution, the relation of automation and data exchange, particularly in the framework of manufacturing and developing technologies. And in this case, it mainly includes cyber physical system, the internet of things and dub computing. The new market we are developing has to take into account more and more factors every single day. As an example, let's take the EU regulated energy market. We have been talking before about that. Solar, uh, so, so far, all analysts agree that it is the right revolution framework for the main objective, which is the transition. This framework favors electricity generations from the renewables. However, this is not the peaceful world we thought we were living in. And unfortunately, we are going to experience new geopolitical milestones every day that will alter the way we live. Putin's words is a very clear example. The market designed until now may have been the ideal for transition, but it does not contemplate the reality life that we are in today. It has been subjected to a real stress test and it has fallen. It has fallen from a social perspective as the bill we received at home reaches stratospherically every single day in values. It has fallen on an environmental level. See the clear examples of the Liberian mechanism, a hastily designed scheme that favors more gas flooring as the commission itself has found. And it has also fallen at the economic level. Companies are running out of liquidity to cope with the volatility of energy resources, liquidity that they have reserved for investment in ecological transition projects. In other words, we are taking away resources to invest in green projects. On the other hand, the ecological transition faces a major socioeconomical challenge, namely the sharing of the cost of the transition. So far, Governments and organizations have mainly adopted political and technical measures, but they have not approached this revolution with a real economical search. The plans in force today are structured on the basis of climate neutrality, the Paris Agreement 2015 of the European Green Pact, while there are few strategies aimed at sharing the cost of energy and ecological transition. On the supply chain side, if we use of fossil fuels plumbing, energy companies will obviously no longer invest in these technologies. Consequently, since the presence of clean energy does not increase at the same time of fossil energy investment, the cost of electricity will increase. In other words, individuals will see their consumption capacity erode and companies will incur to high costs, forcing them to close down. And on the demand side, despite some subsidies for the purchase of more environment friendly machinery and equipment has purchased the electricity vehicles, will not increase until prices go down and performance increases. Likewise, purchase costs will increase as long as import CO2 emitting products are penalized, and in this case, with Chinese imports, Europe's main trading partner. In consequences, I worry very, I'm very much worried that the energy transition in socioeconomic terms could depend the ones of inequality that our societies have been suffering in recent times. This will prevent a key stability for the development of our societies and the growth of our economies. Finally, I would like to point out that the ecological transition is facing a geopolitical paradigm shift that will also affect the market. If up to now our instructions has been concentrated in new 
an inferior few countries with little of no democracy uh, and high levels of poverty and inequality, what is known as the old course. The new reality of renewables will also change, change the game. Let's take Spain as an example. Although it could well be self-sufficient in the production of clear energy, it is more likely for reasons, of course, of tourism acceptability, among others, we will need a percentage of electricity imports, for example, from Morocco, where important solar and wind energy projects are already being developed. However, imports from Morocco could mean the succession of trade with Algeria. 98% of Algeria's export are hydrocarbons. And when demand for this is not so high, Algeria will face not only an economic, but also a social and political problem. And as a result, Spain would suffer a neighborhood and unsustainable, and it's not more so the, that is the current one. So another example at the other point of the world between Indonesia and Malaysia is the Strait of Malacca that it's up 80% of Chinese oil imports, making it this strategic point at almost important for the Asia giant. If China ends up reducing the dependence of energy imports, this area will clearly reduce its international importance and could shift to other coordinators. So in short, to recapitulate, the transition to renewables energy is the third major energy transition in these centers. Possibly the oil transition is the most similar in social, economical, and financial terms, with the consolidation of a oil and the development of financial markets, fossil fuel futures instruments were designed. This is well described by Javier Blas in his book, The World for Sale. The development of financial market change, the reality of the new market, of the old market. So no, one of the great challenges in the economical one, how we get the need investment to carry out all necessary infrastructures is that we have to see how to adapt the market to the new challenges, which in my opinion are social, widespread public opinion and geopolitical new realities and new tensions. The market has to be prepared to the, for the major stress and tension in the international reality. And finally, one very important difference. One thing is one we would like to happen. And the other thing, it was the real life. If we don't take into account these two both sides, we will be out of our responsibility. Our responsibility is to take into account everything that is really happening, to provide it, to have a previous perception and to keep the real situation to what we would like to be. But another very important difficult thing is with some politicians, one, that the real life on itself has to be the real life of the people surrounded. If we arrive to that kind of point, we will be really out of the scope. And who will be finally suffering? It won't be the politicians. It will be the citizens. I will build the companies that we will fight down. They will crash only by the desire on some atopical circumstances that they are out, absolutely out of the real situation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jose Ramon. Uh, very, very interesting, your uh, view uh, specifically about the situation in Spain. <laughs> we would have a lot, a lot to discuss about that. Well, and finally, uh, Manuel Pulgar Vidal, uh, he's based in Peru. He's the global leader of uh, climate and uh, energy at WWF. Uh, well, Manuel is going to uh, explain uh, his views about this topic. Please, Manuel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Juan Diego, and thank you to you all, friends. So this event, this segment, this panel, it is about energy markets, old or new challenges. And probably as kind of conclusion, what I could say it is that we are facing all challenges, but in a new context with new trends and with more pressures. And let me develop my ideas based on what Jose Ramon has just mentioned. 
how much in this new transition towards renewables, technology is developing new ways of addressing the new challenges. But I am all the time wondering why technology it is making this uh, frog leap so important for to move towards renewables. And it is because we have taken good political decisions, the Paris Agreement. We are well informed by science and we are changing the way in which we are developing our economies. And that is starting to happen. So the context in which that new technology developing their new tools and their new ways, it is based in this important trilogy. Because when I talk about the new context, of the energy market that it is facing, probably all challenges. It is that we are not appreciating well how important it is that in the current time times, the world has by consensus agreed in a common vision for the world. So nobody is doubting about the 1.5 and nobody is doubting about the net zero economy and resilient economy by 2050. And it is amazing, probably it is the first time ever that we have agreed on something that it is defining the vision, but also with some means of implementation as it is the national determined contribution and the long-term strategies. For me, those two elements are key because are the political definition of where to go and how to go. And we know that we have to continue raising ambition that we are not yet on track. And that is why, every single year because of COPs, we are pushing and encouraging countries and not only countries but subnational governments and non-state actors to do their part and to define a strong and well-defined pledges and targets to achieve the net zero and the 1.5. But also what it is important it is how much the economy is changing their way of developing the rules based in climate consideration. And probably Europe, it is a good example of what it is happening, but not only Europe, because we are not appreciating the importance of the recent Inflation Reduction Act enacted by the government of the US. And how important and how much interesting it is that law that under the title of Inflation Reduction, what it is mostly pushing, it is a climate package. A climate package that it is oriented to the electrification of the economy, that it is also including some equity consideration, and that it is moving into electric vehicles uh, among some other subsidies to push the poorest country into accessing this new technology. And also the discussion in Europe with the taxonomy, that, 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 that it has been a strong discussion to consider if natural gas is, it is or shouldn't be a, a, a transitional source of energy, or the discussion about carbon uh, adjustment, a board, a carbon border adjustment, it is defining the new ways that the economy, it is including some new consideration. The point, friends, it is that in some way, we are entering into new a new economy with a strong climate consideration that must also change the idea and the concept of energy security. Because if you go into the concept of energy security, it is by now, and still for decades, something that it is more related just to the affordable source of energy, but it is not considering the climate things. And that is why I am all the time thinking that energy security it is a concept that it must change because of this climate consideration. But it is not only because of this vision or how much the economy it is changing, or how much the science is saying, and how much the Paris Agreement has defined the framework to develop new ways, new regulation for the markets, for these markets. It is also about the net zero. And when we think about net zero, I know, and we know that still there are many things, pending things to be sorted or to be solved. And, and, and we have to remember that in the former COP26 in Glasgow, the idea of lack of credibility was raised by the UN Secretary General Guterres by saying we have to secure that the climate claims of every corporation must be strongly supported on science and must define 
ways to be monitored and to be reported to promote credibility. And this lack of credibility, it is not just related to corporation, it is also for countries. And we know that now there is a discussion to define not only the net zero standard that was defined in November of 2020, but also to define the standard for net zero for oil and gas, something that probably could come soon because of the SBTI, the Science-Based Target Initiative, it is developing those rules. But also there is a trend to define how much the net zero standard, sectorial or the broader one, one could be more mandatory because of regulation. So the point is that we are living in a new trend in which potentially the idea of regulations to make the net zero more uh, fulfilling, it could be imposed by the law, by the regulation. And if not, it could be imposed by the courts because that is something also that we have to consider. We have developed our rules, the, the standard, based in a voluntary support, a voluntary basis. But now we are evolving into regulating and it could be that the next step, it would be more rules imposed by the court. But also in this discussion about the net zero, we are still discussing what it could be the role of nature in the net zero and what it could be the role of the bioenergy. There are a lot and a strong doubt of the role of bioenergy to address the net zero. But let me say a couple of things also around the war in Ukraine, because what the war it is showing, it is that the new trend for the energy market, it must be based in cooperation. Europe, it is showing that cooperation must be the new condition for the energy market. And unfortunately, that is something that it has started to happen, but it has not enough well defined to see what does it means cooperation and how much that could mean for the rest of the world. Because today you have mostly talked about Europe, but what about the rest of the world? What is happening in Latin America? Latin America it is strongly trapped in the trap of gas, of natural gas. And natural gas fields and more exploration and exploitation, it is mostly happening in Latin America. And Latin America has not been able to develop a long-term vision to know how are we planning to evolve from the gas to renewable. There are just a couple of countries that are working on that, Chile because of this facility of hydro hydrogen, and some other countries as Colombia no, that are defining the way to define a net zero by 2050. So those are the new trends. And that is the way in which we have to define how much the energy market should define new ways of cooperating and new rules for the future. So again, it is a combination of economy, science and political decision that it is defining the context for the energy market. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Manuel. Really, really interesting. Uh, it's a great summary and uh, a very, very clear view. So right now, uh, it's time for uh, some questions uh, that I will put uh, on the table. So uh, we are uh, targeting some of these questions about free trade. So um, as I mentioned before, uh, the situation right now of renewable energies, it's uh, quite interesting. On one hand, it's growing incredibly, but on the other hand, there's a very clear trend on concentration, specifically in uh, China. So we have seen that uh, the situation of, uh, for instance, wind energy in the world and the barriers to free trade that different countries uh, have. Uh, from your point of view, which could be the mechanisms to promote this uh, free trade? And uh, would you support a keep pro, pro quo trade policy? uh so let's let's go through through this uh, question and uh, first of all uh, uh canerva what's uh, what's your view on that yes uh this is this is very good question as an energy market lawyer and not as a trade uh policy or law specialist i would still come back to maybe uh, barriers in more general so of course like not only 
uh, restructuring trade, with, uh, with uh, yeah, not only limiting trade between two countries, but also maybe it's good to, even in Europe, even in internal markets, so you can see that barriers are actually created by standardization, different kind of standards, different kind of planning uh, environmental requirements and so forth. So I think these are something which which not only in the European context, but of course, uh, more globally, maybe some like create uh, restrictions between or limitations between to trade between countries. Um, when you ask about, would you support a quid for quo trade policy? So I would revert to my, my and many others who have uh, spoken during tonight's panel discussions, uh, I think we were quite, um, we agreed at quite large extent that we should cooperate. And also I think some others mentioned rule of law as well. So we kind of like in the hard times, it's not to try to maybe change unilaterally the rules, but to promote rule of law, pacta sunt servanda, and so forth, also in the international context. And I think I would, I would like to highlight these quotes. So there are practical barriers for free, free trade, even in, in Europe, but also when it comes to international context. So we need to respect um, the rules we have commonly agreed, when it comes to Paris Agreement as well. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm not sure whether we will come to a better, res better result if we try to kind of like try to choose what to pick up and what kind of like um, trade reels, deals we are going to make. So where we end up with this policy, that's my question here. Okay, uh, Manuel, I would like to, to know your, your view about this topic that definitely is relevant. Well, perhaps uh, in Latin America, as you mentioned, uh, well, there are no uh, wind turbine manufacturers or very few of them, some of them in Brazil, no, uh, no solar manufacturers either, at least EV uh, relevant. But I would like to, to know your, your view, uh, taking into account that your presentation was really interesting and dig into a lot of topics. Yeah, thank you, Juan Diego. Let's start by reminding when we think and when we talk about free trade, there are two main principles to not discriminate and reciprocity. Those are the two main elements when we think about free trade, the, the two pillars of any free trade agreement, despite of what it could be the topic. So the point it is, if that is the reality, and let's go out of Europe, let's think in a more global way. The point it is that if we are in conditions to define free trade agreement in relation to energy, if we have some good baseline to define that the world could move into some kind of free trade for the energy market. And what is the point? It is not, we are not in that condition. And, 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 and how to promote it? Because the point is we need an energy treaty, so probably that would be almost impossible. Of not for the short term. So probably it is just by working based in the climate conditions that we could define the new condition for the energy market. I, I'm not sure if I am clear in transmitting this idea. So it is not just about energy, but it is to define what it could promote that common ground to define reciprocity in the energy market that could move us into a free trade. And for me, it is just because of climate and because on how much climate it is defining the new condition for the energy market. Because if not, and without the cooperation and with the current reality in which, re just remember what happened in the last minute of COP26 in Glasgow, India raising their hands to say that coal shouldn't be phased out, but phased down in a time in which everybody knows that coal it is something that we have pushed to be uh, to, to being phased out. So we are still in a time in which, again, 
because of the concept of energy security and friends also i i do want to, to 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 know what do you think about energy security as a concept do we think that that all energy security concept it is, is, is still in force it is or it is a difficulty and limiting the way in which we should move into a new energy market based in climate consideration so to finish uh, juan diego the point is that we have to define a common ground in relation to energy to define ways to promote free trade. Really, really, really challenging. <laughs> I would like, uh, well, this is, this is the pending, the pending topic for, uh, for the close future. And uh, another question, and uh, in this case, uh, I'm going uh, through Jose Ramon and uh, Luis Eduardo. Well, uh, taking into account that uh, Europe as I, I, I mentioned, is almost alone supporting this free trade. Uh, what can we do to protect our, our China? And in the case of China, what would be your recommendations to push for a levelized uh, playing field? But uh, what could be the takeaways from the experience that you had uh, of other sectors, for instance, from, from transport? Well, obviously, uh, I defend the free trade as a liberal. Uh, uh, obviously, can you hear me? I have maybe some kind. Yeah. It's fine. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So, as a liberal, I defend free trade, uh, obviously. But Europe had, cannot be naive. Uh, we had to know. We had to everything that we are going to be. We had to be with the handle of the industry. Absolutely, cooperating together. Why do I say that? I just come from Washington. Last week, I had been in Washington, having some different appointments and meeting with the public and the private sector. They there, they know very well how to manage it. They know they had to be handled by handled. I'm so absolutely worried about in some occasion here in Europe, we went uh, and they on? get along. Yes? Yeah, you're you you're me? breaking you're breaking up, but please continue. Okay, thank you. What I mean is that in Europe, all the phases that we want to go forward. It had to be not alone. I'm very worried about something that is used to happen and trying to do all my best in order to not to happen is that industry is always on our back. And some politicians and some decisions are just alone. I want to arrive to that goal. Okay, perfect. We all want to arrive to that goal. But first of all, is it possible? Secondly, do we have technology to arrive to? Thirdly, have you asked the industry to arrive with you? So if we don't arrive together, our main goals, it will be only the goals of someone, but not the common goals. So one other important thing, sometimes we are saying that we want to lead, but we have to know that Europe is a very piece, a small piece in the world. There are too many big regions as well. The United States, is China, there is India, there is the Asian countries. So can we, how can we do it alone? If we are here a small piece in the world, in some occasions we had to work with one of the clear examples are the cooperation that the agreement between Europe and the GCC countries, the Gulf countries, the Middle East countries. We are arriving to a important serious compromises. And in some occasions, it is supposed that we had to lead, and we can see different countries that Saudi Arabia, you can see Qatar, you can see uh, Emirates, they are a pass forward than us because sometimes we are very theoretical and they are very practical and they are yeah. doing the best and we are path forward so to finish uh we have to arrive but never alone uh, with the uh, industry in our back if we do that we will do the best for the third countries some occasions some occasions even and I, in my 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 personal experience some of them, they ask to you, why are you doing that if you were alone? And you say, I'm sure that you are true. My, 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 my work is not to be alone, but don't, we don't have to go so fast, so fast, so fast. If we are, it is not possible, we will be, because we arrive so fast to the ending point. And from the perspective of the third countries, they will be clapping their hands because they will say, you have arrived so fast, you have a right alone so be careful what we are doing because the world is very big europe is very small we have to lead 
some things, but we cannot be out of the scope. Thank you. Thank you, Jose Ramon. Luis Eduardo, Luis Eduardo your view. Uh, I, I loved uh, this explanation from Manuel uh, talking about the IRA being like a hidden uh, um, global package to develop well, a lot of things, but specifically climate change and pushing climate change in North America, where we will see the nitty gritty of these uh, details at the end of the day and how it's translated into the IRS, but definitely it's going to make uh, a change. What is your view about uh, this situation, uh, this levelized uh, playground that we have and specifically in North America and some North America companies competing in Europe, uh, what is your view about uh, this trade, uh, free trade situation between US and, uh, and, and the United States? Sorry, yeah. well, United uh, States and, <laughs> and the EU. And, well, Diego, uh, let me try to answer uh, straightforward. First, you ask uh, about the free trade, and I think that uh, different countries have different political maturity, different level of populism, et cetera, et cetera. So, but every country needs something and every country offers something. So I will call it a free focus, focus trade, no free open, widely open trade. We gotta be able to do that. We have done that. Uh, capitalist entrepreneur, they have done that. So we need to find a way to have this quid pro quo return. The second question was about China. We need to understand that China is a, is a very interesting animal, but do not underestimate I've been in China many, many, many times. I've been able to do uh, outsourcing to them some uh, manufacturing of very specialized technology for the oil and gas that requires nuclear uh, nuclear resonance uh, sensors, et cetera, et cetera. You'll be surprised how fast they can put their act together and make it happen. The last time we did that, the whole delegation came to us 45 days from the CEO to the lawyers to everybody. We train them, we give them the kids. We finish. 75 days later, I went to Liaho and I was amazed to see exact replica, identical of what I have in Houston, in Hollywood. Identical, but better. So that discipline of manufacturing, that, that, that uh, integrity in, in in the labor, uh, whether you claim that it's been exploded or not, but the output, the results is there. So it's not about cutting. We need to find a way again, like I offered as an example, when we gave them the kits, so they assembled the kits. And what was our benefit? It was cheaper there. Yes, it was less manufacturing in the US, but guess what? At the same time, it was less cost. So we were more profitable and the people that was not longer doing the kits, we were rearrange their labels to other things that are probably higher uh, and more important for them. So with China, we just need to be creative. And I guess I'm repeating myself, with every single uh, challenge and initiative, we need to be creative. There is not a copy cut approach. Every country is different. Every person is different. Every political animal is different. And every human being has a different way to interpret what we're trying to tell them. And finally, with the United States, uh, I always found that uh, regardless of sometimes the shaming debacle that happens in Congress that is, a, is, 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 is seen worldwide, uh, when they put their minds together on something, things move, I move very, very, very fast. And whether we like it or not, the backbone of Liking something in the United States is associated with economic benefit of that. That hopefully also have a direct impact in what uh, our, our friends like uh, Javier and, and Manuel is, is saying, uh, it will impact the society as a whole. So I'm sure that there are gonna be ways where these new technologies could be used, new technologies could be designed, implemented, and the speed of design and implementation that is going to be given by the US side of the equation will be very, very good. I have never met, probably they exist, but I have never met an uh, entrepreneur or a uh, forward thinking CEO that has any hesitation 
to sit with his counterpart in Europe and make a good deal. Never. Of course, behind that has to be a very good legal team making sure that you foresee all the dots and the T's of the cross that they teach in the future because you have your, your head is cold, you can design, you can talk. When, you, when your head is hot because you have a problem, it's too late. But with the backbone of a legal system, I've never seen a problem of very good, two very good CEOs of Europe and the United States putting their minds in something and making it happen. I just don't see a problem on that. Thank you, Luis Eduardo. Well, I, I would like to, to thank all the panelists. Uh, we don't have uh, more time. Right now is the time uh, for the wrap up. Uh, Diego Solana is the international advisor of the World Law Foundation. He's going to uh, go to some conclusions of this panel and some closing statements. Please, Diego. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Juan Diego. Uh, congratulations to all of the speakers. I want really to thank you. Uh, on behalf of the World Jurist Association for this extraordinary discussion. It has helped us a lot to understand, to have a much better understanding of the energy market and the, all the climate change uh, issues. I have, as Juan Diego said, uh, made the preliminary wrap up, preliminary conclusions of this opening session. We will send it to you uh, on a paper and for your comments, your suggestions. And of course, the purpose it will be to that this final paper, these final conclusions after talking with all of you can have a real impact and a real influence on policymakers, not only on the energy market, but also on, on, on all the policymakers related to climate change. So I have chosen, it was very difficult because there are a lot of things uh, discussed, but I, but I chose uh, six points that of course we can uh, maybe increase um, after we talk with all of you. The first one is that the, there's really a right to access to energy, and it's also a fundamental right for people and companies. And uh, if countries try to develop and to uh, tackle this energy crisis on their own and without cooperation, that will be really a confrontation to the European Union principle. So we need to cooperate all together, mainly on the European Union, but also worldwide. The second, the second point is that there, uh, there are a lot of difficulties to compete with China, with China, with Chinese practices, and that uh, this can really harness European economy. However, and as Jose Maria Bauza was saying, um, Europe is a very small place within the world, and sometimes we need to lead, but other times we need to collaborate. The third uh, preliminary conclusion is that. Uh, the response to the current energy crisis uh, has to be led by companies, by technology, but uh, governments also have the obligation to accelerate and to help to uh, develop and to increase the speed of this energy transition to renewables. The, the fourth point is that, as, as uh, Luis Eduardo was saying, is that currently fossil fuels are still the major source of energy worldwide. And the, the figures that he shared on his presentation was really amazing. I didn't, I didn't have those, those figures on, on my mind. Uh, however, there, there, are ways, there are ways to combat, to combat climate change. There's light at the end of the, of the tunnel, uh, particularly through innovation and creativity. Uh, as I said before, also, uh, government can help us, but at the end, financial markets and uh, new technologies companies need to provide us with the tools necessary to, to improve this new uh, revolution, this new energy transition. Uh, uh, our M MP, Jose Ramon uh, Bauza, was talking about the past. Now, how can we learn about the past? This is not the first. Uh, in a revolution on the energy markets. We had previous one, like the industrial revolution, and there's a lot of things we can learn from, from that. Policymakers, the obligation of the policymakers is to develop a framework that can help companies and innovators to develop new technologies and new ways to, to lead this uh, new transition that, as he explained very well, uh, has taken place uh, uh, before, on, on centuries ago, and we will be able to overcome the challenges that we are that we are facing currently. And uh, another thing that I think it was very interesting, at least for me, is what Manuel Pulgar Vidal was saying about cooperation. No? European Union, he was saying, is a good example of cooperation. How to 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 tackle 
uh, this energy crisis. And he, he was pointing out uh, that uh, is, uh, it's important to also uh, underscore that the, there's a common view, there's common ground that people and countries have a common view uh, on at least the, the problem and how, how we should uh, face it. So that's very positive through the different treaties. No? Although there's a lot of things that we should do in the, in the future. And uh, he was pointing out also that unfortunately, and Manuel, please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you were concerned that uh, Latin America was not so focused on this uh, transition on to renewable energies. So that will be my preliminary conclusions. Of course, we will work on them and send it to you on writing and we, put, uh, we will be working on them. And hopefully we will also uh, send them to policymakers. And I hope to see you all in New York during the World Law Congress uh, on July 2021, 2023, uh, not only through video camera, but also alive and to have the opportunity to resume uh, this discussion and, and to continue working uh, on these issues. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.